I've been telling you some stories from the streets uh, where I was a street pastor in Durham, and here's another one. A fellow by the name of Robert Farr uh, was nicknamed Sparky. And yes, my friend on the street also has the same name as our bishop, different guy. Uh, and Robert uh, had an associates in forestry from New York and uh, had ended up on the street. Amazing story how that turned out too. But he was one of the three guys who called themselves the deacons. They were the ones who sort of... Uh, took us under their wing. Like we were the, myself, David, Julie, Sarah, we were the seminary students, we served as their pastors. But the three guys, they kind of walked, watched out for us when things would unfold. Because we would we'd put out a card table, our card tables, people would, 25 people would come out of the woods and, and come off the street from hand, panhandling and we'd have this meal together. And um, when someone new would show up, it'd be one of the deacons, one of these three guys who'd tell us, hey, here's what you need to know about so-and-so. Here's, here's, the, here's the score. And um, this became an important uh, on a regular basis. For example, when Claude showed up, Claude was a fellow, uh, we'd never seen him before. He showed up, we, he sat down, didn't say much. And if you think about the nature of panhandling, holding a sign, will work for food or whatever, you're standing on your feet all day, and then you're living in a tent. Like, when do you sit down? Like, where do you sit down? You don't really have that opportunity. And so to give guys a chance to put out some camp t chairs and give them a, a comfortable seat and a warm meal, people tend to relax and kind of lounge and talk. Claude didn't talk. We were kind of confused by this. So Robert uh, Farr came over, and, and he filled us in. He said, you know, uh, Claude used to work at a battery plant car battery. Make, uh, made car batteries solid. Uh, this is one of those uh, union career car battery plant. Like, you, you got a job there, you work there all your life, good retirement, like good, solid job. And um, didn't have any family, just uh, only child type of situation. And um, he started ceasing to be around people. He developed a, a paranoia, a delusion that people were out to get him to the point where he stopped being able to go to work. And he had health care, and it didn't matter because he couldn't get the right help. And he lost his job, and now he's on the street. And because um, once you lose your job, then you lose your insurance, and you lose your car, and you lose your house. And so uh, Robert's telling us all this, and it was it was helpful to know how to help to be with Claude because. Uh, if we tried to talk, the more you'd, we, had tr we would try to talk to Claude, the more scared he would be. It had taken him four months of watching us sit down with people before he'd gotten to the point where he would come and eat with us. Like, he'd just watch us eat for four months before he finally could, could risk it. The, the, that was the strength of the, the paranoia he struggled with. Claude wasn't the only guy who had uh, mental struggles. Another fellow on the street uh, who had uh, a mental struggle was um, Nick. i would mentioned him before, Nick Mastraco. He was a, a retired Marine. There's no such thing as a former Marine. Have you ever noticed this? A retired Marine. Um, and he was a stout and strong guy. I mean, his nickname was Bulldog, and he looked every inch of it. I know of a situation in which he shoved a car back on the highway when a lady uh, got in a one-car type of accident. And it, amazing fellow. And when he was up, when he was good, uh, like he would warm up, he was just wonderful to be around. He'd warm up his little can of Hormel chili and, and eat half of it, then leave another half where he knew Claude would find it so that Claude would have something to eat because he knew Claude was, it's kind of hard to panhandle when you're scared of everyone, uh, delusional about that. And so, great guy when he was up. But when he was down, woo, baby. He was down. Like, he suffered with, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. My, my, my gut instinct on this is he suffered with a, a depression that was chronic and severe. Just a debilitating depression. And, and it came on and it just would whoop him. And he would just be bad. Night and day. Right? Claude, Nick, they're not the exception. About a quarter of people who are homeless have some sort of severe mental something going on, some sort of severe mental illness. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, a part of our government I didn't know existed until this week. Uh, it's probably, 
And, and I should probably have done this before. It's probably a good time to define homelessness. You are homeless if you don't have your name on a lease or a mortgage or a rent or something like that. Right? There's nowhere you can like defend and say, this is where I legally can live. That's uh, But homelessness in the city looks like uh, what you usually think of people living in woods and panhandling. Um, in rural America, it's much. I, I, it seems to be more like couch surfing. You can find a house to live in, you just can't find a job. Deb is shaking yes at me. That makes me feel good that I'm on the right track. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> uh, if you slice the data on a different way, fewer than one in five disabled adults, whether it's mental disability or physical disability, are employed. One of the reasons they're at such a high risk of being in poverty. And it's actually a situation getting worse. In 1990, 28% of people with some sort of disability were employed. In 2013, it had dropped to 14%. So th this is a challenge. And, uh, and I know my, my uncle was, uh, is, continues to be uh, paraplegic, and he built airboats for decades from a wheelchair. I mean, so people who are disabled doesn't mean they can't work. It's, that's a whole different... Right. Now, you might expect that this, the, 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 the arc of the sermon here becomes the big old sermon about the problems of systemic sin. Like, we could talk at length about the way that a, a, a retired Marine did not get the health care he needs, and man, we need to support the VA, and that's a problem of our society. I, I could get into mental health care in general, like Claude had a good job with health insurance. Why did he fall through the cracks? Right. We could get into... Um, you know, give a man a fish, feed a man for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime, but then there's the next step we forget about. Are there enough fish in the pond, right? Did make, does everyone have a fishing, uh, something to fish with? Like, we, there's a whole sermon there about systemic sin, and I am tempted to get into it, but I'm not. Not going to do it. That's a sermon for another day. We have a temptation to always focus on fixing the problem, right? That I, that's my temptation. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist pastor. I want to fix things, right? I want to get involved and fix it and heal it and work it through and move it on out, right? It, it is my family motto. It started out like 30 years ago as a joke, but it is so very true. The Kuhn family motto, see a problem, solve a problem. That's my definition of leadership. Run towards the biggest problem, right? That's what I do. I, I, I try to solve problems. It is my temptation, that's not the sermon for today, though. We talked about last week, you know, you, uh, you feed your dog, you eat with your family. That, that, that with really matters, right? You can do ministry to people, and that insults them. They're trading their dignity for whatever you're offering. And, and to go from ministry to people, sort of at people, to ministry with people is essential. Like, if we don't do ministry with people, we might as well stay home, because we we're di might be doing more harm than we meant. Right? And I, I didn't even go looking for this example. A friend of mine in a completely different part of the state told me about a church that started up its new ministry, and, and, and it's a... Uh this is not my friend's church. He's the one walking, watching down the road, aghast at it, because here's how it works. You walk into this church, and, and if you need supplies, they will give you a certain type of supplies, fill out the paperwork. And then at the end of it, they ask, um, volunteers ask you, what can we pray for you? And, and the person who went there, uh, that I know about, the person who went there to get these supplies said, no, it's okay. And the people insisted on doing it anyways. And a bunch of volunteers surrounded this person and laid hands on her, even though she said, I'm okay, no, no, please, I'm, I'm, you don't need to pray for me. Like, that's not praying with someone, that's like praying at someone. Like, that, that's a power play. It, that, that's, that is the antithesis of what ministry is, right? If I want to pray with you, we're going to sit down and drink some coffee, and I'm going to try to listen and understand, and then we'll pray with, with your agreement, and once we're okay with each other. Then, like, we, if we're not going to pray with people, now, we've got to get the with down or else stay home. There's a next step, though. There is another move, right? To go from ministry at people to ministry with people is still focused on solving problems. And when it comes to my friends like Nick and Claude, am I ever going to be able to look at Nick and solve that problem? Right. Am I ever going to be able to look at him and say, that's it, we have solved your depression? 
The depression that has crippled you for decades, we're, that's solved, right? Am I ever going to be able to go to Claude and say, your, your paranoia, your delusion, that's solved? Like, we're going to solve that today? No. There are certain problems that aren't going to be solved. There are certain situations that, no matter how much ministry you do with people, they're not going to get fixed. And we have a desire to fix and to solve and to resolve and make it all right. right? But there are problems and brokenness in this world that will not be solved this side of heaven. It's the unfortunate truth, but that's what it is, right? There are things that are broken in this world that are not going to be made right this side of heaven. In the kingdom of God to come, I will know Claude as he was meant to be, but not until then. And until then, what he needs is not someone to try to fix him or work with him. He needs someone to walk with him. That's what we're doing when we gather as church. Church is a family when it's working as it should, and that's what, part of what we're talking about. Part of what we aspire to be for each other is to be with each other, right? When you look around the church, do you see people do ministry at? I hope not. I hope you see ministry to do, people do ministry with, but in the end, what, what are you gathered here as? People to be with, right? There's a difference between trying to do ministry with and in the, in the ministry of just simply being with, because we're going to walk together as a family. And that's, in the end, what the church was for Nick. Because I have to confess to you that Nick was a Marine, because Nick did pass away. When Nick had, uh, he had back surgery, we, we helped him work through the Medicaid process. He got back surgery, and, um, and he contracted MRSA while he was in the hospital. And it killed him. And so for that last month while he was in the hospital, there was no fixing it, right? There was no getting in there and making it all better. What do you do with family when they're sick unto death? You don't fix them. You sit with them. You just be with them because no one should die alone, right? And that's what we did. That's what the church did for Nick. That's what it means. That, that's the, the and, and that's what ministry with, being with. Right? We read in Romans what Paul writes about uh, the love of Jesus Christ, that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the, neither the present nor the future nor the heights nor the depths nor anything in creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. And I think that's what we're looking at today. For people to know that no matter what happens, the love of Jesus Christ will be with them. Right? And it will be with them as the church gathers with them. To be able to sit with and walk with and talk with. Uh, this is what I understand Paul to be further talking about in 1 Corinthians 12. Talks about how every part of the body is necessary. And those parts that seem weaker are actually indispensable. Uh, the parts that seem lesser, the parts that you cannot see, the parts that you don't think about are the parts that are actually indispensable. They are, they are worthy and need greater honor. I want to tell you one last story uh, about how this works and, and uh, about someone who truly is indispensable. And I put a picture of her on the front of your bulletin. To take a gander there, if there has ever been more of a uh, church directory picture, like, isn't that the perfect church directory picture? That, that's awesome. <laughs> Her name is Sarah. Sarah's right there in the middle. Sarah is a friend of mine from Gethsemane United Methodist Church. And there she is with her uh, mother, Pat, and uh, Jerry, her stepdad. Pat was my mentor for uh, almost two years while I was in seminary working as a youth pastor. And for those of you keeping track, yes, I was a full-time student, and I was a street pastor, and I was a youth pastor, and I did sleep on occasion. Uh, <laughs> Pat adopted three children, the youngest of which is Sarah, and Sarah is a joy. If you walk into the room with Sarah, she is the most excited person in the room every time. She is excited to listen to what's up with your life, and she's excited to tell you what's up with... Uh, she wants to hear about yours, she wants to tell you about what she's excited about, and then she wants to go out to eat with you after church. I mean, she is excited to be in the room. She's the one that everyone talks to. She has this instinctive sense for people that is just amazing. And Sarah, as you might be able to tell, has a Down syndrome with all that entails, right? And so she has rheumatoid arthritis very, uh, pretty badly, and um, that, that's a challenge for her. 
And, and what te Pat tells me was uh, back when she adopted Sarah, she, she's another Methodist pastor, and I already told you, Methodist pastors, we want to fix things, we want to take care of it, we want to resolve it, we want to make things right. And, and that's, you know, it's not like she's, she was at all confused about Down syndrome. Down syndrome is not something you, like, heal, but she wanted to make it right and help her all the way she could. And what she realized is Sarah doesn't need to be fixed. Right? She doesn't. You don't fix Sarah. You live with her. You be with her. You enjoy who she is. You care for her and let her care for you. You f let people be who they are and focus what they can do, not on what they cannot do. And I'll tell you what Sarah needs. My friend Sarah needs family. She needs people to be with her. Because she does need some help. She does need some help. She lives in a group home, um, and she is her own person, and, and she has internet access. She needs people to walk with her, doesn't she? Right? <laughs> she is a 30-odd-year-old uh, lady who is sort of um, developmentally about middle school, and she is in a perpetual boy craze, and she has internet access. She just needs family to walk with her, to care for her, to ask how she's doing. And, and thank God she has it. <laughs> there is a Methodist church that has adopted her group home, and it is a good and powerful and wonderful thing. Sarah was raised in the church by the church, and the church has committed to be there with her. As I have talked to Pat, her mom, about this, the question Pat's had to grapple with is what happens after she's gone, after Pat is gone? What happens to Sarah? Like, there are other questions she has to grapple with, like, Pat's never going to retire because try, Sarah needs a knee replacement and uh, trying to get a knee replacement on Medicaid, it, it, so she, she's going to work forever so that she can keep Sarah on her insurance. I mean, there are things like that, but the most, the challenge, the most pressing question is, what happens when Pat is gone? Will the church be with her daughter so that there is someone to be with her when Pat no longer can be? And thankfully, there's this church that has adopted this group home, and, and thankfully that is the case, right? There are people here in Shelbina who need the same thing, who need family to be with. They're not problems to solve, right? We'll do ministry with them because everyone can be in ministry with, but in the end, there are people in our community who need family to be with, whether it is from the brokenness of mental health problems or the, the potential isolation that comes with developmental disabilities. Whatever it is, the question is the same. Will the church not just be in ministry with, doing with others what can be done, but will, also, but will the church also be place to be with folk, to be family, right? and to be blessed by them. Right? I am the Christian, I, I mean, much, much less pastor, I am the Christian I am today because Nick and Claude, we, you could be honest with them in a way, like Midwesterners, can we confess that we have a passive-aggressive streak in ourselves, that when we just kind of dance around some challenging questions, that you don't have to acknowledge it, because to acknowledge I said that would be to, no, you, you can ignore it, that's all right. When you're on the street with people, there isn't any sugar coating, right? When I saw someone and said, man, you're kind of twitchy. Did you see the magic man? The magic man was the drug dealer. Yeah, I messed up, man. And we talk about it, right? I, the ability just to be straight and honest with each other about the struggles of following Jesus, I learned that from the street. I am the Christian I am today because Nick and Claude shared their lives with me. I'm not sure who gave more, me to them or them to me. I am the Christian I am today because of the joy that I was able to be present with, with Sarah. Like, she just has a vivacity and a joy to her that I have never hit once in my life, right? She, her natural setting is to be excited for Jesus in a way that on my best days, I, get a, I, I might get close, right? She has taught me so much about joy. And I've done some things for her, but, you know, but she has given me so much. To do ministry to people, just stay home. To do ministry with people, that's a start. That's good. That matters. That respects people. In the end, we are called to be church, which means being a family is not just ministry with, it's the ministry of being with people. Not pe seeing people as problems to solve, but brothers and sisters to walk with. See the difference there? 
I don't want to be a church that does ministry to. I want to do some ministry with. But in the end, I want to be part of a church that understands that the highest form of ministry, the most faithful way to follow Jesus, is simply to be with each other. To accept each other as a gift. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.